Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Independent City Council meeting. It's Tuesday, November 10th, 2020. It's 6.30 in the evening. Let the record show that councilors are here except for Councilor Ransom Smith, who is excused with the family health challenge, and Councilor Hicks. Uh, I believe this is the uh, time that his daughter is up at uh, Dornbecker, and we're hoping that a transplant is going is moving forward. So uh, um, I think that that's where he is this evening. Uh, council meeting members, you have the minutes from the October 27th uh, meeting in front of you, and do they meet with your approval? I move to approve the minutes as received. I second that. I have motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any objection? Motion carries. We have under visitor comments tonight, we have a community climate task force uh, who have requested an opportunity to make a presentation. And so I'm sure they will, I think Karen is gonna help get them in the room. Are they, oh, okay. I can see their names on the screen. Okay. Okay, and I think there's one more joining. Okay. Mayor, I don't see anybody else on the call. Okay, uh, all right. Well, good evening and welcome to the Independent City Council. We're uh, interested in hearing your presentation. To you folks. Hi, uh, City Councilors and Mayor McArdle. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I'm Michael Carnes uh, at 593 E Street here in Independence. And there are uh, a couple or three additional members of our group uh, on the on the Zoom right now. Um, the Community Climate Task Force is a group of residents of Independence and Monmouth who have organized over our shared concerns regarding climate change. We came together last November after listening for years to researchers providing their data on how our civilization's emissions of greenhouse gases are affecting the future livability of our planet. And we've watched for years as our country has done next to nothing to address this crisis. On a personal note, I was involved in global climate change research beginning as far back as the 1980s as part of my responsibilities at the US EPA laboratory in Corvallis. The progression of climate change impacts will not wait for our national leaders to find consensus around effective solutions to the problem. The purveyors of misinformation and doubt have delayed action to the point that purely market-based solutions will not be enough to avoid dangerous levels of warming, particularly at the rates of change we are now seeing. It's the responsibility of every city to find climate solutions that will both minimize their community's greenhouse gas emissions and allow them to adapt to the effects of global change we have already failed to prevent. It may seem odd to be asking for climate solutions at such a small scale like a city. And while there are many actions that will need to be taken at the state, national and international levels, cities are an important piece of the puzzle. No other level of government has such a direct impact on how its residents live. To remain disengaged from solving the climate crisis is to endanger our lives and our livelihoods and make it that much harder for people to pursue the lives they envision for themselves and for their children. We are asking council to act on three things. First, adopt a climate resolution that emphasizes that future city decisions will be made in the context of climate change 
And I think you've got the text of a, of a resolution, uh, perhaps before you right now. Uh, and and I, I might mention that this resolution, it didn't come out of my head. It's, uh, it's something that uh, has been passed by cities throughout the world, including several right here in Oregon. Second, we ask you to form an intercity board of residents with Monmouth to help find appropriate and effective actions our cities can take to address the climate crisis. And third, develop and adopt a climate action plan. We have both a responsibility and an opportunity to find climate solutions that fit our community's needs. We are here today because we wanna help our families, friends, and neighbors get to the safe, healthy, and hopeful future we know is possible. We need your help to make that future real. Thank you. Is there another speaker? There are the others are there to answer questions if any come up from the counselors. Does anybody have any questions at this time? No questions, but I do have comments. Okay. Uh, first of all, I like something like this starting on a small scale because we have proven over and over again that a grassroots effort can grow into a national referendum. Um, I particularly like the idea of the, the collaboration with the city of Monmouth throughout all of this, making it a dual and joint effort. And for me personally, I find the evidence of climate change undeniable. Other comments? Um, yeah, quickly. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the task force for um, giving candidates an opportunity to, um, to begin to explore climate change on a local level. Um, I, I found the, the task challenging and enlightening as well. So thank you for that. Anybody else want to weigh in at this point? You know, I, this seems like something that uh, uh, we're going to need to have, we'll have to have further discussion on over time, especially as we get into the, uh, you know, starting to look at, uh, we just passed our 2040 plan and we'll have to start putting legs to that. And that seems like this would be the, the kind of thing that we would uh, fold into those larger discussions uh, because I'd, I'd love to see this take from the 30,000 uh, foot level into more uh, uh, reason, it, more hands-on, you know, uh, uh, things that are very specific. And I think that would be the better time. Uh, Tom, does this uh, seem like that would fit in our uh, uh, plans coming up for January, February-ish with the council? Yeah, um, I was going to cover this in my uh, city manager report, but I'll just uh, jump it up. So um, it, we are planning on having our priority council priority setting meeting in January. Um, unfortunately, that got uh, canceled last year, if you remember correctly, because it was on the same day that we needed to start uh, preparing for COVID. But we're really excited to actually uh, do that um, in a very comprehensive way this year. We have the 2040 vision plan, and I'll mention that this is one of the items in the 2040 vision plan. Um, and just from, you know, from a, from, from a staff perspective, and this is really a policy issue, largely, uh, you know, there's going to be staff time and, and, and financial resources that go into that. And so we, we typically take that priority setting meeting and take all of the different items out there, figure out um, how we're going to approach each and every one of them and then come up with a plan for, for doing that for, for at least the next year. So that would be an opportunity uh, to do it. Um, there could be other opportunities, but that would, since that's coming up here relatively soon, um, that would be a good time to really, uh, for council to dig into this um, more robustly. Great. Sound good, council members? I wanna thank the uh, 
the presenters and the group that are on here today for the work that you've put in. I know there's uh, lots of uh, uh, suggestions and ideas that I'm sure they're going to come forward as, as this uh, evolves. Uh, and thank you for caring about this. It does make a, it will make a difference. And we saw from the fires this uh, last year that uh, it's no longer an abstraction. Thanks okay? for, uh, for your time. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks for the rest of you, although you didn't speak. Uh, thank you for being, for being part of the group. Okay, uh, moving forward. Uh, Ms. Johnson, do we have any other uh, public comment? Uh, no, I see a shake of the head, no. Okay, we're gonna continue moving forward to, um, I'll give my mayor's report. Uh, last time I uh, informed you that we, I had had the opportunity to visit with uh, Congressman Schrader about the uh, importance of Highway 22 and 51 and move forward on that. Since that time, I've also had a chance to communicate with the uh, uh, Mid Willamette Valley Area Commission on Transportation with the chair and the vice chair about uh, the importance of this and it is on their radar screen and they know that it is important. Uh, looking at ways to secure funding at the state and the federal level and uh, we don't know how the federal funding is going to flow, although there uh, is continuing talk about uh, the, inf the importance of an infrastructure uh, bill coming through. We don't know when. Uh, the second thing is coming up in this next, uh, uh, later on this week, the community care organization uh, that serves this area, which is Pacific Source Health Healthcare, is uh, going to be uh, uh, joining uh, Mayor Kuntz and I and some staff folks and looking at a number of different locations in both communities with the goal of expanding uh, med medical care in our region. And so that uh, uh, they recognize there's uh, a healthcare desert, or at least a dry spot here uh, in our two communities. And so they are looking to expand that. And so that's a joint effort that the, the mayor and I have been working on for a while and uh, uh, they'll be taking a look around. Uh, just for your calendars, council members, uh, I'm on the uh, Council of Government's annual uh, meeting planning committee. And we have a tentative, tentative date of February 17th for a, uh, uh, a virtual uh, annual meeting. So if you'll put that on your calendar, that's a Wednesday, uh, probably around six o'clock. So if you do that. Finally, uh, you see me without a mask right now because there's absolutely nobody in the room. I want to just emphasize uh, after visiting with uh, other local officials, the numbers for COVID exposure are exploding in Oregon and they are exploding in our area. Uh, I really need to emphasize to everybody watching how important it is that we have people wear masks. Anytime you're not with your family members at home, uh, when you're with others, you must wear masks. You've gotta get your kids to wear them. You've gotta get the middle schoolers, the high schoolers, college students to do this. It is ultimately important. There are some places around the country that did not do this and look what's happening to North Dakota. So I just uh, implore you to wear a mask. Just uh, the businesses are doing a really good job of that, uh, but we need to do it more in the community. We absolutely need to do that. And I just can't emphasize that enough. So I'm asking people to please do uh, move forward on that. And uh, it's not just about each one of us, it's about the others that need protection, the older folks. So we all know some uh, younger children that have compromised immune. There are all sorts of folks we need to protect and wearing a mask will do that. So it's not a political statement, it's a healthcare statement. It's about keeping our neighbors safe. So please do that. Okay. Mr. City Manager, would you like to uh, take it from here? You're muted, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So um, just a couple of uh, things that are upcoming here um, and then some other announcements. Uh, uh, League of Oregon Cities is going to be doing their uh, elected essential training uh, starting December 1st through the 15th. 
Um, but uh, we have actually been working, uh, by we I mean uh, the new city manager of Monmouth, he's been there for a week and we're already working together and partnering on doing things. Uh, and one of the things we're working on is uh, bringing Bill Monahan from the Mid Willamette Valley COG to do some uh, training um, on council essentials, essentially. Uh, our hope is that we can have the new councilors um, get uh, detailed training and all, have all of our council be able to participate in that. Um, uh, we're looking to do something at the, the fire station. Uh, and if we can do in person to have the uh, newly elected council members from both Independence and Monmouth be there and then have our councils uh, participating virtually so we can keep the numbers down. We'll have to see how that all goes depending on where uh, the uh, guidance is at that point in time. But we're really excited about this. Um, this is something that uh, Bill is a great trainer. Um, I've known him for a long time. Uh, he does uh, this very well and this is a great opportunity for um, everyone to get very uh, good information about uh, their roles and responsibility as council. Uh, we'll follow that up with some specific independence um, council training on council rules and some stuff. We'll probably do that at our priority setting meeting, which uh, I mentioned earlier, which we're scheduling for January. Um, but that'll be nice because we can then just do something very specific to independence. It'll be fairly short. Uh, and then we can get to the uh, real work of setting priorities. Uh, the training, it's, it's pretty in depth. And so it looked after going through it, talking with Marty and with uh, Bill Monahan, uh, it's probably gonna be around four hours. And so we're thinking that we would like to break that up into two evening sessions rather than trying to ask you to do something at night for four hours. So more to follow. Uh, we're gonna be looking for dates and, and figuring that out. Um, but I think that's going to be uh, great for everyone, for us to participate, including uh, uh, staff members who uh, can hear the same thing that you're hearing and make sure that we're all uh, getting off on the same page and, and moving forward together. So uh, we have, as you know, put out the um, utility grant program. We to date only have 11 applications for the grant program. Uh, we knew it would be a little bit of a slow start, but uh, we certainly need to pick that up. Uh, this is money that is available for people who are struggling to pay their utility. So we're going to do a lot more effort to push that out um, and make sure that people know about that. We'll probably do something with our utility uh, billing as well to make sure that people are aware of that. Um, but essentially, yeah, if you're having a hard time making uh, your utility payments, uh, you can uh, go to uh, Mono Amano's uh, site and um, if you make the qualifications, uh, they will uh, work on helping you to pay uh, utilities for a month. So we're, we're excited about that program, uh, but it is off to a slow start, um, but I'm fairly certain that before it's over, um, which it has to be over by the uh, end of the year uh, when the funding runs out from the CARES Act, um, it will have uh, utilized uh, everything that we uh, put into it. So Tom, I, I did have a question. So you, you said it's the end of the year, is a, as long as the program goes? That's correct, yeah. It's kind of, the funding for this is the CARES funds and all the uh, expenditures from the CARES program unless the federal government changes the rules have to be expended by December 30th. Yeah. It's just my concern is that that's when the, the bigger utility bills are gonna be hitting. So uh, hopefully we can figure out some way to extend that program. Yeah, and we're, we're definitely taking a look, as I mentioned before, of, of coming up with some sort of local a donation program as well um, that we can do that can be an ongoing thing and um, whoever knows maybe the federal government will surprise us and actually put in a place another uh, act that we can use as well although i would say it's getting um it's not looking promising that it's going to be ready by january 1st at this point but we'll, we'll have to wait and see uh technical assistance program we've talked about that a lot and um i'm glad to say that uh monmouth has uh participated in that program as well now and so we're going to be able to serve 30 businesses we actually have 30 businesses uh who have applied for that um, program uh the main areas of interest are um, creating or reworking websites identifying and implementing new ways to identify and connect with customers developing content and strategy for marketing the business online. So we had a number of different programs. Those were the ones that people really, uh, or businesses really wanted to do. So we're really excited about that. I know the businesses are really excited about that. Um, it was a lot of work to put together, but we're, we're, we're glad to that it has uh, been fully utilized. Uh, the Independence Downtown Association received a grant to add some holiday window painting along windows in downtown. 
Uh, so they are doing a holiday gnome on the Rome theme. And uh, so window painters are gonna be jumping around town this week, painting uh, gnomes on storefront windows. I think City Hall is gonna get one as well. So um, that's exciting to, uh, to, to uh, do. I think I uh, mentioned last time, and I wanna uh, send a big thank you to the Public Works for helping out with the installation of holiday lights uh, in the amphitheater. Um, it's a much bigger display than we uh, thought we were going to have, um, but that's partly because we had uh, Public Works do a lot of the work, um, and so we were able to put more lights up. So um, not only will we have gnomes running around, we'll have uh, bright lights for them to, uh, to play with. Um, broadband program. Uh, as you know, we got a grant to do a broadband program to uh, hook up um, kids uh, in our school system that didn't have access. Uh, so I'm happy to say that there have been 51 installs um, and that has enabled internet service for 106 kids in the central school district. Uh, I have to say a big shout out, shout out to Minot for, for making that happen. Uh, Minot has done a lot of work and they've got a lot of other things going on, but they prioritized this work to make sure that uh, kids could have access. Um, we're excited about that. The next step of the project is to create uh, uh, Wi-Fi zones and key locations around uh, Monmouth and Independence. Um, and uh, for Independence, we will be expanding the existing Wi-Fi uh, range and capacity at the Civic Center, Riverview Park, Inspiration Garden, the library, and the new museum. Uh, Monmouth is also going to get a, a large number of areas that will have um, internet access as well. So uh, kids or others who don't have access to internet can uh, basically pull up. Um, they'll have a, a free internet access and be able to um, to uh, do what they wanted to. So we're, we're really taking some of the limited um, opportunities that we have around and, and expanding them so they're much more robust um, and work better. Uh, just a little story from the library. Um, last, uh, we've been doing a lot of programming out of the library um, during uh, COVID, um, a lot of it video content. And sometimes uh, we have, uh, you know, um, a fair amount of work to do to make sure we have the actual licenses and the approval from the authors um, to use their content. And so uh, last month, uh, Leanne and Eric uh, emailed one of the offers of a book that they wanted to use uh, for story time. Um, and they found, uh, his name is Jose Carlos uh, Andreas uh, in Spain. Um, so they translated uh, the request letter, emailed it to him. Uh, Jose gave uh, us permission to use the book and asked if we would send a link uh, of our program once it was done. Uh, he uh, thanked us uh, for doing that. And then he um, commented on our Facebook post. So uh, we have an international uh, link now to all the work that the library has been doing to uh, promote and and uh, be there for kids during this. So uh, thanks to Jose for for standing up uh, and letting us do that and and also uh, uh, responding to that. Uh, some things um, related. Uh, if you haven't heard, um, and I'm kind of doing this as a public service announcement, uh, hopefully for Oregon OSHA, um, the Occupational Safety Health and Safety Administration has um, published new temporary administrative rules. Uh, for the state. Uh, those take place on November 16th, so that's coming up. There's a fair amount of work to do. Um, I, we will be uh, compliant with that uh, before the 16th. We're, we're making good progress on it, but I just wanted to let people know that um, that is out there. Um, it, because it is a, a, an Oregon administrative rule, it has the full uh, weight of the law that goes with it, so um, OSHA can certainly come in and um, check on your business uh, if you are. So that's not just public governments or local governments or counties, that's uh, every business um, that uh, falls under OSHA's uh, purview. Um, it needs to probably go up to their website and figure that out. We have been working on a, uh, a civil citation cleanup project. Um, judgment remedies expire after 10 years. Um, and according to our city attorney, they are not collectible after that point. So any civil um, citation that we have issued uh, after 10 years, we can't collect on it. Uh, we have had uh, many, many, many um, on our records. And so we've been working on a process to clean that up and make sure that uh, our uh, records uh, have all those uh, figured out and noted and make sure that uh, we're not trying to collect on those after 10 years. 
So we just uh, finished a project um, that uh, cleaned up the citations that were 20 years old or, or more. Um, that was a lot of work. And now we're working on the civil citations that are between 10 and 20 years. There's about roughly 80 citations a year that we don't collect on, but over time, um, that really adds up. Um, and so as we did uh, looked at that, that uh, 10 to 20 year period, um, the amount that was out there was not trivial. It was about $415,000. So we went in and took a really close look to see what our policies and practices were. Um, we have some new personnel in that area. And we also have new systems um, that uh, I don't think we were fully utilizing in the past. So we've created a, a new system in our financial software so we can track all the non-payments and run a monthly report so that we know what's going on. Um, we are also coming up with uh, guidelines and a process uh, and reports to make sure that we're timely getting um, uh, things that we can't collect on after a certain period of time to collections so that they can uh, start working on that. So anyway, I just wanted to let you know because it was a large amount. I think it surprised us when we took a look at how much that was. Um, and I think that we um, uh, feel uh, it important that we actually um, address that and make sure that we're doing a, a great job moving forward. And I'm, I'm certain we will. Um, so just a little quick uh, public service announcement. Um, this is probably gonna be for one per individual who probably will know who they are. Um, but we had a package that was addressed to someone that was returned to the library for insufficient postage. Um, and the library was the return address for the package. Uh, the library did not recognize the package, although when it came back. So um, they took the package over to the post office who opened it up. And when they opened up, they found that the package contained nothing else but marijuana. So um, I'm just letting someone know that if they send a package to Virginia, the package is not going to arrive. Um, and that if they want to claim it at the Independence Post Office, I'm sure they would be happy to assist them uh, with figuring out the proper postage for a package, but it might cost them a lot more than they initially had anticipated. So with that, I will turn it over to you for questions for me or my staff. Questions for the manager after that story. Okay, I see shakes of heads going like, oh my goodness, improper postage. Okay, let's keep moving forward. Uh, I think we have a presentation. Good evening, Mr. Evander. Well, it looks like Fred might be having a little bit of trouble connecting. I know he was having uh, problems with his um, with his uh, ca uh, camera. I guess that's what they call it um, earlier today. So, Fred, if you want to jump in here and get things fixed, uh, just uh, let me know. But um, we have been working diligently on uh, the transportation system plan. All right, there you are, Fred. Go ahead. You're muted, Fred. Hey, everybody. That same thing happened to me earlier today when I was talking to Tom. Um, sorry about that. Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, how's everybody doing tonight? So anyways, what we're here to talk about is the transportation system plan. Um, uh, we have on the line with us our consultant on the project. He is going to um, share uh, some of the, the sort of major concerns that we've heard, some of the problem areas, and then he's also going to address some of the alternatives that we've considered. We keep on trying to get public outreach, public input on this uh, project. It's, um, I mean, it is somewhat difficult given COVID uh, and all that stuff. So anyways, um, uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to him and I will be sharing uh, my screen. So please hold 
for just one second. There it is. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Bell, and welcome to the Independent City Council. Thank you. Um, yeah, while Fred's pulling that up, I can just go ahead and get started. Some of this is um, largely based on what Fred just mentioned. But my name is Matt Bell, and I'm a transportation planner with Kittleson and Associates. I'm supporting the city in its effort to update the transportation system plan. I am, we sometimes refer to it as a TSP, but I'll try not to do that tonight. I'm here to provide a brief update on the project and just to talk about a few key issues as well as the alternatives we developed to address those issues and to get your thoughts um, on how we should be proceeding. So maybe before I get going, I, I have a um, three-year-old having a hard time this evening. Um, you may hear him, hopefully he won't make an appearance, but um, that's, going on in the background. So when we last spoke, we had completed an inventory and an evaluation of the existing transportation system. That evaluation, along with feedback from our advisory committees, as well as a public open house, or sorry, a virtual open house that we held with the public, helped us to identify a number of gaps and deficiencies in the transportation system. Over the last several months, we have evaluated the future transportation conditions and developed alternatives to address all the gaps and deficiencies under existing and future conditions. We've also met with our advisory committee and held a, another virtual op open house where we received a significant amount of feedback on, on um, those alternatives. So we're currently in the process of selecting a preferred alternative for each of those gaps and deficiencies. And um, some, of those, some of those we're gonna talk about tonight. Our next step will be to develop and prioritize projects for the TSP based on the goals and objectives and the available funding. So the slides that we, the slides that, that are here tonight are, um, again, these, these largely reflect some of the some of the um, real critical gaps and deficiencies in the transportation system, as well as the alternatives that we addressed, and we're hoping to get your feedback on these. So there's about there's about five that we want to cover, but there's certainly more that we could cover. We just think that these uh, tend to be the most critical. So this first one um, is Monmouth Avenue and, and Main Street. So right there, right there at the corner, it's one of our one of our key study intersections. And the intersection is, um, as, as mentioned here, is a prominent pedestrian intersection. It experiences long vehicular backups, especially during the, the weekday evening peak period, which is the period that we evaluated for the TSP. So by, um, by probably long before 2040, but certainly by 2040, we do expect the intersection to be operating at level service F, which is, um, which is a high amount of delay and um, leads to a lot of the situations like you're seeing right there, maybe maybe in some cases worse. So we we have evaluated a number of different alternatives, and this is this is the short list of those alternatives. We have we already received again feedback from our advisory committee, from the public, as well as ODOT on the ones that we had to take take off the table. So these are the ones that are left. And just real real briefly here, we. Um, the types of alternatives that we're considering is, is, that is potential turn lanes at the intersection, recognizing, of course, that those impact parking on, on the adjacent street system. Looked at a, a traffic, signal, um, tra traffic signal warrants at this particular location um, are actually met in the long term. So it's, uh, so it's a potential alternative out there. Um, one of, the, one of the things to note about, uh, about traffic signals, particularly on um, state highways though, is that the state typically likes to see turn lanes associated with traffic signals. So you would most likely, in addition to a traffic signal out here, also see separate turn lanes. So you know, you're back to having those on-street parking impacts. Next, we also, we also considered reconfiguring Monmouth Avenue as one way and um, essentially developing both a, looks like, it's like we're just referencing the square about here, but um, so a little square about around the, around the corner of um, C Street, Monmouth Street, uh, and between Main Street and and Second Street. So just some kind of like kind of like a, a really a, sh a short couplet, but also known as a, a square about. Um, one of the less conventional uh, alternatives we had here was a, was a roundabout. 
Um, this would obviously be a really small roundabout in this particular location uh, and operate a lot like um, an all-way stop control. And then the last thing that we're, we're considering out here is, is, is the potential for the Southern Arterial. So something that we'll talk about in a couple of the other alternatives and a couple of the other slides is this, the, the notion of an arterial along the Southern part of the community was, was um, developed as part of that Southwest concept plan. It's, um, it's kind of been on the books for, for a long time, but it's also a real key corridor in the Southern part of the city to provide access to and kind of activate that Southwest area. So when we see that arterial coming online, we see a lot of traffic getting pulled off of Monmouth Street away from that intersection and, and, and down to the south. So with that arterial, we also see intersection operations improve. So we kind of developed our alternatives, not just here at Monmouth and Main Street, but throughout the community with consideration to the potential long-term for that Southern arterial. So the question that we have for this one, as well as the other ones is, um, what are your thoughts? What, what can you see as being a preferred alternative here? And we can either talk about those now or I can, I can go through the next few slides and maybe say, and try to save a little time for us to talk about at the very end. Why don't you go through all of them and then we'll come back and have a discussion. Is that okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. I see shake of heads, yes. Please move forward. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. So this is down at, at River Road and Main Street. And so this is obviously we're facing, facing across the river here. Corvallis is, is Corvallis Roads to the right, Main Streets to the, to the left. And this intersection similar to the one up there at Monmouth and Main is expected to also operate at level service F, but also has a high number of, of crashes at this intersection. So we have a combination of both existing safety as well as long-term operational issues that we're trying to address here. So similar to the other intersection as well, we did take into consideration the potential for turn lanes, recognizing that a turn lane on, on River Road there would ultimately impact the bridge and potentially require some widening on the bridge. Um, we also considered reconfiguring the intersection as, an, as a four-way stop, installing various left, left and um, right turn lanes out there. And another less conventional configuration would be to, um, if, you can, if you can picture this one, to allow traffic coming to and from the north and across the river to essentially operate free. And all the other intersection approaches would, would stop at, the, at this intersection. So in other words, if you're traveling um, west across the bridge, you can make a free right turn movement onto Main Street. If you're traveling south on Main Street, you can make a free left onto the bridge. And so those two movements operate um, as if it's kind of like a through movement where all the other approaches stop. Those ones are a little bit harder, harder to model and, and less, less conventional, but um, they do work in certain circumstances. Um, next slide. So Polk and hey, Main hey, Street. Matt, did you want yeah. to mention the, the single oh, lane roundabout there? I see that. Sorry. Yes, a sing and a single lane and a single lane roundabout. Uh, another potential alternative here. And I think this is um I think we, we we thought about this single lane roundabout in a couple different in a couple different potential locations. One is right here at the at the bridgehead, the other would potentially be a little bit further to the north on G Street. And the, um, recognizing that one or the other could potentially allow for vehicles to turn to and from this this um, this bridge, and potentially redirect some of the traffic away from some of those more critical movements. Right, and we recognize that just about anything that we're thinking about here is going to have impacts on right away or the bridge um, width. Right. So Polk Street and Main Street. So this is this is um, another intersection that's fairly heavily used by pedestrians and bicyclists. Experiences um, a fairly significant amount of, of truck traffic. Polk Street connecting to Hoffman Street, connecting all the way over to 99. Um, also, also has a, a fairly high number of, of um, crashes out here compared to other intersections. And then and then of course has has a long term potential for some operational issues. 
So again, a number of um, a number of alternatives were considered out here. The ones that we ended up with was the potential for a left turn lane um, on on Polk Street. So the left turn lane. The reason why you hear us talk a lot about turn lanes, particularly at intersections that have safety challenges, is because they they kind of separate the the vehicle movements from the through and the slowed or stopped vehicles. They also can provide additional capacity and sort of separate out the movements that are operating um, at, with higher levels of delay than the ones that that are not. And and then um, we also considered another thing was reconfiguring this intersection to be more similar to some of the other intersections along the corridor where there isn't a dedicated northbound and southbound left turn lane. And what the reason why that matters is because today people that are turning left from Polk Street either from the eastbound direction or the westbound direction, they can't turn directly into that center two-way left turn lane. They have to actually turn all the way into the travel lane. But having a two-way left turn lane along the highway would allow what we call a two-stage left turn movement where you turn into the center lane and then you merge into the, to the traffic lane. And that just um, increases the capacity out there. It's, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, Clever names for that particular type of treatment that I won't I won't mention tonight, but um, the, it, it is it can be an effective treatment, and I think that you've you may have experienced this yourself along along various um, segments of Monmouth Street as well as Main Street. Next, we also considered the um, uh, a potential another single lane roundabout out here. Um, roundabouts just um, just for the just to mention, we do consider roundabouts at a lot of locations where a traffic signal may or may not be warranted. In general, ODOT would would um, not install a traffic signal if the signal isn't warranted, and in some cases wouldn't necessarily support that as an alternative. However, they will still continue to allow something like a single lane roundabout. Um, and in this particular location, we weren't meeting signal warrants, but we could still do a, a single lane roundabout. However, as we know there, it could potentially have um, require additional right away as well as impact the, um, I believe that's a multifamily residential unit in the northeast corner of the intersection. Next slide. So this one, another one of the key, key issues is just general in general access to the Southwest area. And so just real quickly, what we're trying to highlight here is um, a fairly significant amount of effort has gone into the planning of this area to the, uh, identifying and designating a, a street connection for this area that ties into the city's existing street network as well as the Monmouth street network. And then, um, and then ensuring that these streets are all gonna be able to adequately facilitate access into this area. So it, it may not surprise anyone either, Buddy to, to know that the, um, some of these key intersections, 7th, 13th, 16th, G Street, these uh, as well as um, the potential long-term arterial street there, intersection in the bottom right-hand corner, all have potential operational issues in the long-term and all need to be addressed to some degree to uh, continue to provide access to this area. We also need to make sure that we have uh, adequate local street access and that those local streets aren't aren't relying on some of the higher classification streets to, uh, to, to enter into this area and, and, and wouldn't necessarily want to encourage development along those, those, um, those higher classification streets. And then lastly, just wanted to establish the strong bike and pedestrian connections uh, um, into the key destinations and other trails in the area. So one of one of the things that we're we're use, utilizing as a as an input to this project is is the parks plan, as well as the the trails that are identified in the Southwest Concept Plan. So this area does have a fair number of uh, potential trail connections through here that would augment support any kind of bike and ped connections on the street system. So an, another one of the key issues here is just providing bicycle connections over to over to Monmouth. So today there are very few good bike routes that exist between Monmouth and Independence. Monmouth Avenue probably provides the the most the most direct and continuous connection, Hoffman to some degree as well. The um, the long term potential though here is to is to enhance the enhance some of the existing connections along Hoffman and Monmouth Street provide new connections that, that you can see the one there on the north connecting Marigold 
across the detention areas and, and potentially all the way over there to the east to the um, to it, another trail system along the riverfront. The, um, the Ash Creek Trail is is um, is is here as well and, and represented will be represented in the TSP. Also, another thing that we've considered is creating a new trail and potential bicycle boulevard along E Street to um, to potentially serve as a parallel route to Monmouth Avenue, where we may not necessarily be able to meet the, the quality or the level or the, the um, amount of comfort that we want to gain on Monmouth Street for bikes and pets. So getting them down to E Street, providing them a continuous connection all the way over into Monmouth. And then um, a little further to the south there, providing an, another connection on Madrona that would um, connect into connect into Monmouth. So I think, I think that's the last one. And um, looking to you shake your head, Fred. I'm pretty sure that's the last one there. Yeah, but um, again, those are those are kind of the five real so five key issues. You know, addressing some operational challenges at some um, of the more critical intersections, providing access into that southwest concept area, and ensuring adequate um, bike connections between Independence and Monmouth. So just. I, I know that I went a little bit long there, but I'd really like to hear your guys. Actually, real quick, maybe one more thing I'll say before I turn it over to you guys is um, we are we, um, we are planning to host a Facebook Live event on December second to share a lot of these a lot of the same um, a lot of the same concepts and um, issues and concepts with the community. This would. This would really just be to provide a, a more direct face-to-face -face type of an interaction with um, with community members. Our while while we feel good about the amount of responses we've got out of our last two open houses, both of those open houses were virtual and didn't really offer the um, the kind of face-to-face -face interactions that we like to get as part of this process. So we're going to host that Facebook Live event, share a lot of these same um, concepts solicit additional feedback on what ultimately becomes the preferred alternatives for the DSP. So with that, I'll stop talking and um, let you guys ask any questions you might have. Questions or comments? Uh, Councilor Kaur. Um, I realize the roundabouts are possibilities on some of these slides. Um, I lived in Europe for many, many years. I love roundabouts, but Americans just can't handle roundabouts. Um, I just want to comment that an education plan needs to accompany roundabouts. Um, there was one installed on a base I worked at in Germany. It was a multi-lane roundabout. And after about 20 fender benders, the base had to put together a video to show people how to ride through a roundabout properly. The right of way is a big issue, obviously. Um, that's one thing. The Polk and Main, I can't even imagine a roundabout at Polk and Main considering how many 18 wheelers go through that area. You know, they typically drive over the roundabout to get through it. Um, but good point about the, the multi-family housing right there too. I hadn't thought about that. That's obviously gonna be an issue. Um, this may be a question for you, Tom. We haven't heard lately about the Safe Routes, routes to School grant that is supposed to improve the sidewalks and, and put in bike lanes on Hoffman. Is there any, any effort? I mean, is there any update on that? And, any connection between the two efforts to improve that area? Uh, you know, let me check. Uh, I, I asked uh, Kai for an update on that a little while ago. I, I think you know that's a county project, and I haven't heard it uh, recently either. So let me let me get some more information, unless Fred knows more about that, okay. and uh, we'll we'll be happy to get back to you. So we so did. Just I, I will just say that we did provide some comments on plans, but then we haven't seen any revisions from the plans since our last comments. Okay. Um, and the only other question was, why was 4th Street identified as the start of the Monmouth Street one way? Just curious. It's, good. it's a good question. I, I think um, initially the reason why we had identified 4th Street was because it was one of our study intersections and we wanted to un fully understand what the, um, what the operational impacts of routing traffic away from Monmouth Street and onto C Street and back down somewhere was. 
And so I think Fourth Street was was sort of serving as a proxy for how it could potentially be operating at Third and, and maybe to some degree Second, because we just don't have we don't have intersections or understand the operations there. But Fourth Street was also a um, seemed like in a uh, and Fred, you might have some other thoughts here as well, but just recognizing that when people are maybe diverting around the Monmouth and Main Street intersection or looking for an alternative way to connect back over to Monmouth Street, that 4th Street was sort of a go-to for some folks and just provides that, provides that connection. Was there any consideration for the fact that Independence Elementary is right there and there's a ton of traffic associated with that? Definitely. And um, the and we have we had some alternatives for Fourth and Monmouth Street that sort of spoke spoke to that one in particular. Um, took into consideration that the maybe making that se short segment of Fourth Street a one way southbound could um, could potentially alleviate some of the some of the traffic in that area as well, just preventing northbound movements through the intersection. But evaluating the trade offs between that and a variety of other alternatives. Thank you. Other comments and questions? Yes. Go ahead, Councilor Morton. Will the presentation on Facebook that is going to open up on the 2nd of December be similar to what we had tonight? A little more polished, maybe, but yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I'd be very interested in hearing the feedback comments on that, if they could be organized and presented perhaps at our first council meeting in December. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, thank you. Tom or Kathy? Yeah, and, and I guess for me, I'm, I'm a very visual learner. So as you're talking about, you know, sort of these, you know, square abouts and roundabouts, um, I guess to actually sort of see a mock-up of that would have been really beneficial as I'm trying to visualize that intersection at, um, you know, the highway and, and Polk Street without the, the big semi-truck blocking the markings on that turn lane and trying to visualize what you're talking about. So maybe some additional graphics would be helpful to others as you kind of go public with, with the presentation. Just a thought. Yeah, I, I would agree with uh, Councillor Martin Willis about uh, having maybe a few mock-ups about exactly what you mean uh, that, that, that I forget we called square about um, how that would really work. Uh, also had a question about putting a light in at uh, Maine and Monmouth, would that be something where, where each direction would go uh, on its own? So so first it would be southbound and then it'd be northbound and then it would be eastbound. Would, would something like that work? Or would we be trying to move southbound and northbound at the same time? Or how does that work? Uh, for, for now, I think the... If, if, we, if we had to get a separate left turn lane, for example, at the northbound approach, what I would guess is the northbound left would go and then the north and then the, um, so the northbound left would probably go and then both the northbound and southbound approaches would go. Um, if we didn't have to have a separate left turn lane at the northbound approach, then both the north and south would, would likely be able to go at the same time. And, and when we get the final report, will there be kind of a, uh, maybe a grading of uh, effectiveness versus cost uh, with some of these alternatives? Um, yes, to, to, some, to some degree there's, and, and part of the reason why we, ident we identified the, well, a few of the alternatives that we had identified tonight are alternatives that we have already sort of done a preliminary screening on. And, um, and an intersection like Monmouth and Main Street, where we have a half a dozen or more different alternatives, there are um, the trade-offs between the different alternatives, like in some cases are significant, but in other cases are, are very, are very similar. 
And so um, to some degree, we, we would, you know, we might need to beyond just the cost benefit type thing, we might need to consider other, other potential impacts. One of the big, one of the big deterrents for a traffic signal right there is again, the potential need for separate turn lanes and the impact that those turn lanes have, not just on parking, but also on the, um, the curb extensions uh, that are at the intersection that you know, shorten the crossing distances for pedestrians and sort of contribute to that, to the, the environment people are used to right there at that, that intersection. Mayor, I have one last question, if I may. Sure. Tom, maybe you know this one. Um, any idea if the roundabout on 99 and Cloud Corner will be in beforehand so that we can have some time to assess that before we make any adjustment or make any recommendations regarding roundabouts in town? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, they are making good progress on that project, but I think they're still a fairly significant way from actually having that fully designed, implemented and constructed. And that's gonna be a much different type of roundabout than we're gonna probably be looking at at the local levels. But there are many, many um, roundabout uh, examples out there that would fairly represent, I think, kind of what we're talking about. So, um, you know, certainly there is a there is a learning curve to roundabouts in communities uh, and some communities uh, figure it out pretty quickly, some don't. Uh, but uh, I, I think, you know, probably the, 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 the important point of what Matt and, and, and the team are trying to present here is, you know, we're, we're looking at all of the alternatives. So we know we have these set of problems and you know they're really throwing everything out that's a possible alternative some of these alternatives in certain areas just they're not going to make sense for a lot of reasons and they'll get you know removed as we kind of narrow down and winnow down to what that preferred alternative is going to be um and you know that's a part of the process we, we want to make sure that all the ideas are thought about they're they're discussed and they're getting the input that you guys are giving tonight and we're really hopeful that that Facebook, you know, presentation will actually do a lot more so we can gather that information. We can talk about the, the tough things and come down to, you know, that list of things that actually really make sense. Because ultimately we're going to bring bringing back a transportation system plan, which is a really high level document. This is not, you know, down at that very minutia level of, you know, exactly how things are going to happen. It's going to be, you know, in general, this is what we're going to do. And it leaves us the flexibility to actually figure out how and when those are going to get implemented and more importantly, how they're all going to get paid for. So, you know, we, we certainly have a lot of process and you're kind of jumping in right at that, that point where we, now we know what the problems are. We've got a list of all these different possible alternatives. And now we need to go through that winnowing process, getting that public input and figuring out what works best for the community. But certainly if we do come up with roundabout options, I think you're right. We're gonna to need to explain what that looks like, or if those become, you know, move forward in the preferred alternatives, we need to explain what those look like, make sure that the community understands, you know, um, you know all the impacts of that and, and make sure that we have a community that can actually utilize those as they're meant to be meant to be. Well, I have a couple of thoughts that I'd like to share. Uh, I'm very concerned with some of the things that are suggested for Maine, Monmouth and Maine, uh, because I, uh, so all those suggestions, uh, when we're, if we're starting to add uh, lanes and things like that, all of a sudden we inviscerate what we've spent 20 years in building a, a pedestrian friendly uh, uh, downtown. I have real concerns about that. Uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, over the last several years, and as, a, as you might imagine, in the last several months, spending many hours on some street corners watching uh, the traffic flows for a variety of reasons. And uh, I have some questions that I think are really important. Uh, how much of the traffic that's coming over, uh, as I watch things from the bridge, people coming over the bridge, how much of that uh, Salem coming from uh, Salem side and going north on Main Street, how much of that is passed through traffic that's on the way to West Salem? Because I know a number of people from West Sa that live in West Salem are coming through, the, uh, through South Salem over the Independence Bridge so they can avoid the downtown Salem uh, bridges and the backups that are there. Also, I have questions because I know a number of people are, are cutting through again from Salem to Highway 99 uh, with uh, uh, to get to Corvallis 
or in other places like so i'm I think that there's some uh, real questions about how much of the traffic that we're dealing with is passed through traffic that is uh, shortcutting our way because of the problems in uh, the bridge systems in Salem. So uh, I would really love to know a little bit more about that. Do you folks have any uh, information on uh, where people are coming and where people are going? We do, and we've made estimates about what we would consider to be pass through traffic. Um, we have a slightly different term for it. So if you're looking through our, our technical memos, the term we would use is, is external external or pass through traffic. And, um, and th we have various ways of, of estimating what that is. And um, largely what that's, that's based on is, um, is the growth that is expected in these different areas is over time. And so what we considered was traffic from Monmouth traveling to something like Salem or from Monmouth traveling to a place like Corvallis. And, uh, and then so people basically passing through on Monmouth, people passing through on Hoffman, people passing through on Main Street. And um, probably the most, uh, just think of the most significant increase in pass through traffic is definitely the one that goes uh, along Monmouth and up Maine, and so maybe between Monmouth and Salem, the, on the on the north from the north, to and from the north, and some of the other ones, it's um, because they're not state facilities. We don't have as much historical data, and it's harder to it's harder to um, estimate trends out there. We had to make some assumptions about that, and so from an overall growth perspective, the volume of traffic traveling through is is quite a bit lower than what we're anticipating circulating internally, but um, it, it's it, the volumes in those areas are still fairly significant. And you can see from the intersections that we're identifying as our more critical intersections that those are the ones that we're largely trying to address. As a person who lives on Monmouth and 7th Street, you know, I'm aware of the, uh, the challenges there. I also want to really weigh in that the, uh, uh, the east-west uh, choice, the south, uh, southwest uh, area that you have up there on the screen, tra moving traffic uh, east-west is uh, hugely important uh, because uh, if we do not want to turn our community into a, uh, uh, a traffic, we don't want to turn Monmouth uh, Street into a, a major arterial. Um, it's already a major arterial, but a bigger arterial and trying to uh, divide it up for cars. We need to really, in my opinion, uh, really uh, go east-west in that southwest area because that's, uh, that's a huge opportunity for people to move and keep our downtown and our uh, uh, residential flavor, uh, a residential flavor and not a traffic uh, it doesn't need to be a car world is what I guess I'm trying to say. Um, and so I, I feel pretty strongly on, on some of that. And you've already heard some concerns about, uh, you know, if we're going to try thinking about uh, picking up right of way, you know, we've got trying to deal with ODOT and trying to, if you're trying to pick up right of way, I think that there's some real different uh, difficulty. So anyway, I really want to weigh in on the uh, East West uh, to the southwest area, how important that is uh, for this whole area, because I think that could take care of a lot of a lot of the other challenges. So, I'll be really interested to see what uh, additional input is, and I would really uh, want to be very aggressive in reaching out because the choices that are going to be made here are uh, generational choices. Because once we make some of these decisions, uh, that influences the character of the community not just for a few years, but for a generation or more. I guess I made a speech. Yeah, Mayor, I'll just add to that. I mentioned that that was one of the game changers in the 2040 vision plan. Um, after talking to everyone in the community, it was clear that uh, without that connection, it was gonna have a, a very negative impact on the community in the long run and we need to solve that problem. So that's certainly high on our priority list to figure out. Great. Yeah, and I, I think that I, I mentioned early, but something I'll, I'll just reiterate is that with, within the context of all the different alternatives we identified for the failing intersections on Monmouth Street, 
we did consider what the south our southern arterial would would do to those those intersections and for the most part the amount of traffic that shifts to the south or that we would anticipate shifting to the south does address a lot of the operational issues so with, with that southern arterial you may not need something like a traffic signal or a roundabout at monmouth and maine you may not need various um, in, improvements that we, we identified about a half a dozen or more improvements at seventh and at fourth and a lot of those improvements aren't aren't needed with with that southern arterial again because because of that additional connectivity that it provides so in many ways that kind of a solution talks to what councillor takus was about on the cost benefit ratio of uh and doing a proper fix instead of having to uh, uh do cookie cutter and uh, uh paste and do baling wire and and other kinds of things in other places so I'll be really interested to see how that goes. And I know we have to fight with ODOT and the rail folks for uh, overpass over the uh, uh, the rail lines and getting through some wetlands, but it uh, uh, seems like we're gonna have to climb that mountain. Are there other comments that need to be made by anybody? Did you folks, did counselors find this helpful? I see lots of shaking of heads. Okay. Great. Well, one real quick plug for our project website. It's um, www.independencetsp.com. It has all of our technical memos, provides information on uh, all of our upcoming meetings, and um, it's all available to the public. So thanks for having me. You guys have a good night. Thank you. Okay, let's continue moving forward, council members. We have uh, Mr. Pesimer, you have uh, a liquor license recommendation, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor um, and Councilors. So there's a lot of uh, language in front of you, um, but really this is a fairly simple uh, proposal. We actually talked about liquor licenses and potentially simplifying the process probably eight months ago, nine months ago, um, and kind of had a little brief conversation. And so this is kind of coming back from, from that conversation. Uh, and essentially, really, uh, this is just cleaning up uh, the language to make sure it's current. Um, the original uh, documents were adopted, you know, 25 to 30 years ago, um, almost. And so they're, they're fairly old, um, and, and we wanted to make sure they were um, current with state law. So really, the only change that is in here um, that is significant is removing the requirement to formally uh, publish a public hearing notice in, in a local paper. Um, when this was adopted you know, 25 years ago, uh, there was a lot more frequency uh, and options of, uh, of print. Um, we didn't have as good of uh, ability to uh, put information out. And so what we found um, recently that's been problematic is trying to make the deadline to make sure that uh, when we have new businesses come in that we can uh, relatively quickly um, approve uh, liquor licenses. That has been a, a, an issue for a couple of our new businesses as they've been trying to get open that we just really haven't been able to respond as quickly um, as they would have liked. Um, and so really that's just a simplification. We think that we have the tools to get the notice out. Um, it would certainly go out in packets. Uh, it, we aren't proposing uh, changes to council from hearing these, um, but I think uh, things have just changed over time, including the fact, in, and I wasn't here uh, a long time ago, but I think a thing, the problem in independence is from what I've heard relative to liquor licenses and some of the issues that we have when these uh, the, this was passed have, has gone down significantly over time. So um, really that's my, uh, my um, presentation. So if you pass this, uh, it would just be updating it and then uh, removing the um, the requirement to public uh, publish a public notice in a local paper. So, questions for the staff member? Okay, I'm not hearing any questions. Uh, this is an action item. If someone would propose action, I would appreciate it. I would be happy to, and I'd like to say first that. I think this is important to change our notifications based on use of uh, facilities to be notified with 
and the paper has uh, been eclipsed by all social activities online. So therefore, I um, move to adopt resolution 20-1514, amending the city's notice and hearing requirements for OLCC liquor license applications as submitted. Second. I have a motion to second. And I think the number, I think it was 21541. It says, I'm, I'm looking at the, the uh, council packet. Uh, you are correct. It does say on the resolution. Yeah. Yeah, I just, yeah. Apologies just, for the typo. Yeah. Okay. We know which one we're talking about. Everybody clear with this? Mm -hmm. I have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? I hear no discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposition? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Council announcements. Anyone? Um, I guess just real quickly, um, I would like to wish the happiest of birthdays to the United States Marine Corps. Um, and then tomorrow, of course, is Veterans Day. And uh, so I hope to see flags out and folks acknowledging the service of our veterans. Thank you, Councillor. Good reminder for all of us. Additional comments? If not, if someone would care to adjourn the meeting. Move to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Is there any opposition? Motion carries. Thank you and have a pleasant evening.